So, God's word, people's need together in application. Everything we're thinking about is ultimately um, about scripture. It's about exposition. Um, and we've looked at the difference between verse by verse exposition and verse with verse exposition. In particular this week we've been thinking um, more focused on a, in a focused way at verse with verse exposition or topical preaching. So you know you, you, you think of what is the topic you want to speak about, um, what, is, what is the need uh, and then we apply that grid, collect and categorize what do we collect? Well, actually the most important thing is to deal with God's Word. So what does God's Word say about that? We collect some other things too, um, but that's the key. And we've always talked about that. It doesn't matter what style of preaching, it's still exposition. So whatever scriptures you choose, you, you make sure you're going to use that well. You know, Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, um, you know, you need to correctly handle the Word of Truth. Um, categorize sometimes you you look at the verses you've got and already you start to see that they group into certain themes research and reflect but we spent a lot of time thinking about research is the technical part of the, the sermon preparation and we thought about that reflect this is the meditation we reflect on on what God's Word says apply and arrange uh, we've talked a lot about application and in particular if um, the point of my message is application then make the application your points we've thought a lot about that uh, and uh, and arrange as well apply and arrange fashion and flavor we talked about how to perhaps fashion that structure um, to enable people to hear a flavor we've talked about all sorts of illustrations uh, trim and tie how we sometimes have to trim the amount of material we're using because very rarely will someone say to you I want you to preach and there is no time limit <laughs> there will always be some sort of time limit even if you're not given a time limit you will start to see the limit in people's eyes as they start to fall asleep um, and then we tie, we tie things together, you know, tying our introduction, tying our ending uh, to our purpose. So we thought about that. So we're now on the last leg and we're, we're thinking of communicating to change lives. And what we're going to do is in some ways we're going to pull all of these threads together. Delivery, I think, can make all the difference in a message and a response. We thought a little bit about our responsibility, but actually listeners have responsibility too. And maybe we should do more work on how we actually listen to God's word. People are now used to entertainment, aren't they? And they think everybody, everything should be entertainment. The danger is, um, and, and I think that's true with our part of God's vineyard, the danger is that it is very entertainment based. You need to be very careful of that. My brother is, has just done a sabbatical and he's been doing some um, research about worship. And um, there are some big similarities between so often how our churches treat worship and, um, you know, people following the latest rock star. Celebrity worship leaders, because that's what they are, aren't they? And uh, what I'm doing, I, I think we maybe need just to step back and think what's happening here. Have we taken on board so much of the culture, so much of the culture, that we're in danger of transforming worship into something which it isn't and shouldn't be? Anyway, that's just a, a throwaway line. I forgot what I, where I started on that, actually. Oh, yes, that's right. Listeners. So people come now... Um, as consumers in the Western world, they come as a consumer. And there is something to be said about how we r really work hard at listening. And I do this, I, I've heard some bad preachers, but as long as they're not preaching heresy, I hope, hopefully I have the maturity and the hunger to sort through and to listen even harder to, to get God's word. But Obviously, we want to make it as easy as possible, don't we? 
Um, so we're thinking about how, how we deliver a message and um, make that easy to listen to, easy to respond to. Um, the wise man's words are like goads that spur to action. Um, intelligent people think before they speak. What they say is then more persuasive. And I think it's that thinking is, is important. As a Christian, I'll have to be honest, most of the times I, I foul up, it's normally because I haven't thought properly. Uh, and so we need to think, how do we, when we think, how do we present this message? Our preaching model is Jesus Christ. Um, the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. So in Jesus, we, we see something unique about the content, but also there's something unique about the delivery. Jesus' teaching style, the parables, was unique. Jesus is famous for that teaching style. You think of a parable, you think of Jesus. You think of Jesus, you think of a parable. So eight questions to ask when preparing messages. Here are eight questions. Number one, to whom will I be preaching? Whom will I be preaching to? And again, we, this is by way of summing up. Jesus always started with his audience. It, it's clear. I, I was just reading this morning in Matthew's Gospel. Um, it's that period after the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. It's that last week. And it's, it's a time marked by absolute controversy. And the way Jesus speaks to the Pharisees is really harsh. You know, this is not gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He pulled no punches. It, it was brutal. But Jesus wouldn't have spoken like that to the sinners and the tax collectors. So in one sense, you, you see Jesus um, speaking very clearly in different ways to different audiences. Um, I love this. This is from the Living Bible, 1 Corinthians 9. Whatever a person is like, I try to find common ground with him. So he will let me tell him about Christ and let Christ save him. I do this to get the gospel to them. And I think we need to, to do this. You know, wh how can I make, what is the point of communication? We always need to find bridges. So, for instance, I eat a lot in my local Indian restaurant. Um, they're from Bangladesh, they're Muslims. Um, and some of them are pious Muslims. They're, um, they're not extremists, but they, they want to know God. They want to honour God. And so we have uh, often, often, when, when I'm there, I, I speak about my faith in Christ. And there is a common ground, actually, that they, they honour God. They really do. And they, are, they know that God is righteous and they want to live righteous lives. So there is a common ground there. And they've allowed us, we, we've run alpha courses there. And, and there was one occasion when one of the waiters stayed in the room as we did the Alpha course. So you look at those common grounds, don't you? Um, speak only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. That's a really, actually, a fantastic verse for a preacher. Ephesians 4.29. You might want just to circle that. Speak only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Which therefore means we do need to discern what are their needs. What are their needs? Because sometimes you, you can speak to someone and the words are great, but it just doesn't connect. Because actually, that word might not be according to their needs at the moment. Three things get our attention. Three things get our attention. Um, all of us now, we have filters. Immediately, we have filters. In, a, in an age of information overload, is that true? We are... Um, and you know all the statistics, you've done stuff on that. So, the only way we can live is, is we have filters, because we just can't take in everything. So, but three things bypass those filters. Things we value. So, if something, we've, something we value, you immediately think, ah, and, and you will see uh, or hear through all of the stuff coming at you, all of the information. That's something I value. Things that threaten us. That's another thing. 
Okay, so if a lion came into this room, I guarantee we would respond very quickly. Okay, <laughs> what we would do, we would grab Stuart and we would throw Stuart to the lion and then we would make our escape out of the window. Because, and this is, this is not from the Bible though, this, this, this very famous, okay, you're going to have to tell me where this phrase comes from. Because the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Who said that? Is that Joseph Stalin? Nope. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Nope. Nope. It was Dr. Spock. <laughs> Star Trek. The needs, the, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So sorry about that. But, uh, anyway, but things that threaten us get our attention, don't they? Uh, I'm actually, I love Star Trek. I'm, this is my, what's called my guilty secret. My wife and I, we love Star Trek. We just, that's oh, fantastic. I, I get so, and then people, they, they, they hear that and they think, oh no, he, he's, you know, something, anyway. <laughs> What gets our attention? Things we value, things that threaten us, things that are unique. Things that are unique. And in, in some ways now, Facebook is just full. It's like a, Facebook sometimes can be like a, what I would call a freak show. Just these bizarre things put up. Now, I think the, the ground the preacher should occupy should be the things we value. That's the, that's the ground we should occupy. And if we're talking about things that people value, that's much more likely to bypass the filters we all employ. What are the things we value? So actually, that's a good question, isn't it? If you're, you're speaking to a group, what are the things these people value? Two, what does the Bible say about their needs? What does the Bible say about their needs? So again, this is summing this up. Jesus always spoke to people's needs, hurts, or interests. I think um, we need bifocal. In fact, my glasses here, which are so filthy, it's unbelievable. My glasses now, I, I have two lenses in here. I getting older so my eyesight's not as good as it was and the glasses I had before were what you'd call half framed glasses okay and what I didn't realize I don't need um, glasses for reading okay so what I was doing um, I was looking through my glasses at the distance that was fine but when I was reading I was reading underneath my glasses but I didn't realize I was doing that. So when I got some new glasses, I got something like this, but then I, I couldn't read underneath the frames and I couldn't see. And I thought, this is ridiculous. I have to take my glasses off all the time, even to, to look at my watch. That's no good. So what they did, they put in effectively two lens. The top lens, actually it's a little bit more complex than that, enables me to see distance. And the, the bottom of the glass just enables me to read normally. Now, we actually need something like that because we need to see a number of things at one time. We need to see God's truth, but we also need to see people's needs. Um, and again, we have thought a, a, a lot about that. Um, John Stott, preaching is essentially a bridge building exercise. It is the exacting task of relating God's word to our world with an equal degree of faithfulness and relevance. Now, don't underestimate the task there, because I think we've now started to see, this is a big thing, isn't it? This is a big deal. This is gonna demand the best of us, the best of our intellect, um, the best of our uh, character, the best of our imagination, the best of our spirit as well. Um, we don't have to make the Bible relevant. I think this is important, though, too. It is. I think the Bible is relevant. But hear this. We do have to show its relevance by applying it to today's 
needs. We do have to show its relevance by applying it to today's need. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. The, some people say, oh, there are so many verses in the Bible I don't understand. And that causes me problems. Listen, well, that's well and good. But the verses in the Bible which I find most problems with are the ones I do understand. <laughs> don't you agree? Jesus says, love your neighbour as yourself. Now, I understand that. Do I have a problem with that? <laughs> Would you have a problem with that if you found that your neighbour was funding ISIS or a cult or Al Qaeda? There we go. <laughs> but Jesus says it. It's at the heart of the gospel. I just actually I read that again in Matthew this morning. What's the what's what's the heart of the commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and then love your neighbour as yourself. This is the summing up of the law. Everything hinges on those two things. Now I understand that. But do I struggle with that? I do. I really do. So what we have to, we show its relevance by applying it to today's needs. So we, we do need to apply that. Actually, of course, Jesus did that too, didn't he? Who is my neighbour? So actually, Jesus had to apply it by telling the story of the Good Samaritan. So Jesus had to apply that. Samaritan. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think, that the importance, isn't it, of bringing God's word, people's need together in application. I think that's true also in, in good churches. Because, uh, you know, you, you go to a Bible-believing church, they know these verses. They've probably memorized them. Um, so, we, you know, we've read the book. We've got the T-shirt. We sing the songs. But actually, it's, it's about being doers of the word. We... As I've just said before, all of us, all of us know far more than we do. I do. I know far more than I do. And as a preacher and as a pastor, as a, as a, a Bible student, that's especially true. So I think there is always scope. And that's actually where sometimes taking familiar passages and applying that, that you, you find that the newness of what God wants to say to us. We apply those things. Um, I, I've just put down there, and, and this is, we've actually changed this slightly now. In our morning services, we, we normally do verse with verse exposition. In our evening service, we, we normally do verse by verse exposition. Um, we, we've actually changed that. We stopped doing an evening service. We've gone to some midweek events. Um, but our morning event, although actually saying that, I, I think we've, we've changed that again. Because what we have felt, because we get a lot of new people in, people need to, to hear the Bible more clearly and, and see what God is saying. So actually, we've, we've made some adjustments. So um, although we do sometimes preach in the morning, verse with verse, more topical exposition, we have changed. And what I've just felt God calling us to do is we look at themes... We look at topics, but rather than just do lots and lots of verses, we might look at a passage. And it gives us better chance to exposit that. And that's, that's happened really in the past 12 months. I'm still thinking about your comment about um, we, we know far more than we do. do. And uh, thinking about like Proverbs and, and you know, the Hebrew mindset of if, if you know it, then you do it. And if you don't do it, then you're a fool. Yeah, yeah. So, put another way, we're, we're fool. a lot more <laughs> foolish than we think we are. We are. <laughs> Absolutely. We are. Um, just that there's that, there's a famous, and I've forgotten who this was. It was a South American I think it was from Argentina, and so, you know, he went to his very large church, and he, he preached a sermon on loving your neighbour as yourself, and everyone thought, brilliant, brilliant. So the next week, um, he stood up, and he gave the same message word for word, oh. word for word. <laughs> so people kind of thought, 
uh, have we missed something here? Maybe he made a mistake. But they, they kind of humoured him, thinking, this is, this is great. You know, thank you, Pastor. But they, they thought it was slightly odd. Third week, he did exactly the same, word for word. By this time, people were starting to get slightly concerned. They thought, has the pastor, has he lost it slightly? <laughs> week four, the same thing, word for word. Now, by this time, the, the elders thought that we have to have a chat. So the church leaders went and said, Pastor, you, have you forgotten how to preach? He said, no, I, I'm just waiting for you to do it. <laughs> um, well, there we go. Is there a fault behind the evening services, verse by verse, and morning? Is there a... What's the fault behind it? The idea behind it? Yeah. Oh, the idea was, in the morning, um, you would have, that's when you would get a, a mixed group of people. So um, we will pick up in the morning um, lots of people who are not necessarily Christians, they're searching, they're evening, you'll only get the saints. So in one sense, in the evening, you can start there. You, you don't have to explain. Now, you still, you still got to remember everything, but you can start there. In the morning, and even now, even though we have changed that slightly, we still need to start here. The only difference is, I think, is that we now take bigger sections of, of Scripture. So there are still themes, um, but rather than take a number of verses, I'm happier with a, a larger section which we'll look at. Does that explain that? Yeah. 